Well, welcome back uh, to this, these studies in the book of Revelation. And wow, what a book to study in, in times like these. And the overall message of this book is, one, to see how good and gracious and long-suffering and patient God is with lost mankind. But there's also this note of not just the assurance that God wins in the end, but all the way through that he maintains his sovereign rule and authority and he keeps, preserves, and protects those that are his own. So this is a great book for us to study and consider. And we approach it with humility. We know there's a lot maybe we don't understand or misunderstand. But they said, and he said at the beginning that we blesses that man who reads and take heed to the words of this prophecy. And so we're going to plunge in and, and take it up. Now, before we, today, before we move into chapter 12, though, I want to go back and have another look at Daniel 9, 24 through 27. And I want to consider this in more depth and detail. This passage in Daniel is of extreme importance from a, from a prophetic standpoint. And I really want us to uh, make sure that we see it and appreciate it and understand it. Now, before we get there, let me put out of the, the disclaimer, which perhaps is obvious. But nonetheless, I realize that uh, the view I take here is not going to be shared by every evangelical scholar. But I will tell you this, I find it very convincing. Well, let's see what I'm talking about here shortly. So let's pray together and ask His grace and wisdom now as we plunge into this uh, really a astonishing word from the Lord. So let's pray together. Father, how we praise you and thank you that uh, you do have this all planned out, that you know the end from the beginning, but you allow human wills to make choices and, and experience consequences. That's frightening in some respects. It's blessed in others. But we pray, Lord, that uh, your light and your truth will go out all around the world. And we need to work while it is still day because surely the clouds are gathering and night will come when we won't be able to proclaim your word the way we would like to or want to. But we can now and we should. So bless us, meet us, and quicken us in this, we pray and ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's uh, turn now to Daniel chapter 9. And specifically here, I want you to pay attention to what we find here in these verses. So let me move this around just a tad so you can see the whole thing. So let me read this because this is amazing here. Daniel 9, 24, 70 weeks are decreed for your people and upon your holy city. And then what does he say? To finish transgression, to make an end of sin, wow, and to make reconciliation for iniquity. Some translations say atonement. And then what? To bring in everlasting righteousness to seal up visions and prophecies. I mean, they're all finished. They're all fulfilled. And to anoint the most holy, and the implication is the most holy one. Then he gets more detailed. That's a general statement there in verse 24. That, <clears throat> that's what this is going to end up with. The 70 weeks, at the end of the 70 weeks, this is going to be accomplished. And then he drops back to break down the 70 weeks and says this, Know therefore and discern. So we're supposed to figure this out. 
know and discern that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem unto the Messiah. Again, some translations are going to say the anointed one, but that's what the Messiah means, the anointed one. The prince shall be, and then he divides this up, seven weeks and 62 weeks, which equals 69 weeks when put together. But it will be built again with street and moat, even in troubled times. Okay, then he says, after the 62 weeks, and understand, he puts this in a specific order. The seven weeks have already happened, and then after the next 62 weeks have happened, so essentially it's after the 69 weeks, if you total it, the Messiah, listen to this, will be cut off. Wow. Is that not point blank specific about what's going to happen to the Messiah? And you'll have nothing. It'll be as though he lost. Everything is taken from him. He's stripped bare and seemingly defeated by his enemies. And the people of the prince that shall come. Now, look, it's not the prince, but it's the people associated with the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood, even un... And then he adds this, and even unto the end shall be war and desolations. They're all determined, all the way right through to the end. Okay, so he gives this in, uh, indefinite and undeterminate kind of stretch of time after the 62 weeks. But then we come to verse 27, and he says, And he shall make a firm covenant. Now, who's the he here? Well, it has to refer back to the prince that shall come. He shall make a firm covenant with many for one week. And that's why we look at verse 27 and say, That's got to be the 70th week. We've already had 69, and so here's another week spoken of. And in the midst of the week, or the middle of it, he will cause the sacrifice and the grain offering to cease. No more sacrifices to God. And the wing of abominations will come, one that makes desolate, even unto full destruction, one that's decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. So he makes this abomination of desolation, which even Jesus referred to in the Olivet Discourse. But there's going to come full destruction on this final figure. Wow, there is so much here. This is just enormous. Now, let's put again all of this in context. Remember that this word from the Lord that came to Daniel through the angel Gabriel came as an answer to Daniel's prayer for the restoration of the people of Israel. Daniel had seen reading in the scriptures, and he mentions this in Daniel 9 too. In the first year of his reign, he says, I, Daniel, perceived in the books The number of years that, according to the word of the Lord, to Jeremiah the prophet, must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, and he saw it was 70 years. He was reading Jeremiah. There's a couple of references to this in Jeremiah, but Jeremiah 29.10. Thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you, And I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. Wow. There's a point blank prophetic statement of the Lord. Now Daniel saw this, read it, and it it thrilled his heart. But he looked around him and he didn't see much brokenness or contriteness 
uh, among the people of Israel, and it, it was heartbreaking. So Daniel took it upon himself in his prayer. He prays on the basis of this promise, though, and he goes back to the Lord with utmost humility and contriteness, and he, even if the nation won't confess their sins, he does. He confesses the sins of the people as though they were his own. He identifies with the people and, and cries out to God for forgiveness and restoration. Now, you know, this is just a Daniel 9 is his prayer and uh, 4 through 19. You do well to turn there sometime and read. It's a beautiful prayer. It's a wonderful example of godly biblical prayer. Number one, he makes sure that there's no unconfessed sins. He wants to make sure he's open and broken before God. <clears throat> then his whole prayer is, is based on Jeremiah 29, 10, that, that God is behind us in this. He's willing to do this. I know he wants to do it. So in essence, he was pleading this before the Lord. He says so in Daniel 9 and verse 2. So he's praying on the promises of God. Now, God, he's claiming them. And you know what? God wants us to do this. He wants us to come back to his word. He loves this when we pray like this, biblical praying. He wants us to pray on the basis of his word and claim his promises. That glorifies God. Now, let me apply all of this to us. There's so much here that's blessed. Look at this. Number one, one man interceded before God for an entire nation, and God heard him, and God answered. Yeah, I don't see a lot of brokenness and contriteness in the United States of America, but here's hope that if enough of us will intercede with brokenness and contriteness before God, maybe he'll hear our prayers and forgive our sins and heal our land and revive us in these days. We should be praying Daniel's prayer in these days. And God answers in powerful, powerful ways. So for ourselves and our country, here's a great prayer to come back to. But that said now, in answer to that prayer, Daniel is given assurance that his prayer will be answered, but he's given so much more than that. Now, it's as though God is saying this, something like this to Daniel. Okay, you're claiming Jeremiah's 70-year promise of the deliverance from your captivity. Good. Okay. But let me tell you about another 70 in which I will complete all of mankind's captivity and complete my ultimate plans for mankind. Wow, this was exceedingly abundant above all he could have asked or thought. Now, this 70 in verse 24, I think, does play off of the 70 of Jeremiah in 29.10. But it's so much more than that, is it not? So what can we observe about this? Well, we know that we're dealing with a, a period of time, 70 weeks. I mean, that's all the way we measure time, weeks or years or days. So he's dealing in, in that sense. And then after, in, down into verse... Um, 26, after the 62 weeks, so it's after some period of time. So this is a time factor to be sure. Now, some people look at these 70 weeks and they say, 
this is just symbolic. 70 is the number of perfection. So 70 must be in just an indeterminate long period of time. Don't make too much about it. It just means a lot of time and then something's going to happen. Now, uh, there's debatable things said about that. But look at the what he says here. Number one, Jeremiah's 70 wasn't symbolic. No, it was completely literal. It was fulfilled literally 70 years. So what do we make of this 70 weeks? I also want you to notice something that makes me think this is not just indefinite, who can tell. He divides it up really very precisely. Seven weeks, 62 weeks, and then the final 70th week. That's, that's on purpose. There's some delineation here. And so whatever we see here in verse 24, we know that we're looking at the culmination of God's plans for the earth. This is end time stuff that's totally clear. Look at what's said here. One, there's, look what's removed. Transgressions are restrained or removed. Sin is finished. Iniquity covered. And then the things that are given. Everlasting righteousness. Christ, our righteousness, shall appear. Uh, completed vision and prophecy. Everything sewed up, completed and fulfilled. And the Holy One is anointed, what? King of kings, Lord of lords. I mean, this is clearly refers to the end of time. So we have a, yeah, a long stretch here. So how does this work? If we're going to say there's some literal fulfillment to this, how does all this work out? Well, have a look now at this issue, too, about these weeks. What do we mean by these weeks? Is that a literal week? Well, obviously not. The word there is, the uh, Hebrew word is heptide. And it's simply a unit of measure. But we know it's not a literal, totally literal here, uh, meaning literal week that we would think of as seven days. Why? Because a literal week would have been 490 days. And none of the end time things have happened uh, for 490 days uh, after uh, this prophecy. So these things uh, seem to have happened in, not in a span that short to be sure we're not there yet. So what time frame is he talking about here? And is it right to think of this? Uh, in another context. All right, so 70 years was the context with Jeremiah. And so when we roll it over and say 70 weeks, is it possible that he's talking about seven-year weeks? So 70-year weeks, which would be 70 times 7. Now, this concept is used elsewhere. And we know in the way this is used, it does uh, extend to the end time with a real precision. But this is not an uncommon use or combination of thought in, in the Hebrew uh, vocabulary. Look at Leviticus 25 and verse 8. You shall count seven weeks of years. Seven times seven years. So that the time of the seven weeks of years shall give you 49 years. And he's speaking about the Jubilee years. But don't you see it's point blank here. Is it not seven weeks of years? So that I think we can say when we look at that, and also down in Leviticus 25, 3 and 4, he uses six years and then a sabbatical. Uh, but the sabbatical is not a day. It's a sabbatical year. 
So we have this mixing together of weeks to designate days, but weeks to also designate that expression used to designate years. So then, I do believe when I look at this that we're talking about 70 times 7. Now with this in mind, let's go back uh, and have a closer look at this prophecy and see what we can find here and, and see what it says. Now, what do we find? Now, verse 24, as we've seen, is, is amazing. It, it's a general summing up right from the start of what will happen after these 70 years. Once again, let me move this down a little bit for you so we don't cover anything. So it's a general summing up of what will happen after these 70 years are complete. And we've seen it is truly amazing. Well, let's come in down to verse 25. Know therefore and discern. In other words, you, I want you to know this, that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and then added to it 62 weeks. And it shall be built again. Now he's talking about it being the city. Shall be built again. With street, moat, even in difficult, troubled times. Now, what does this refer to? We know that there were three, some count four, but there were three decrees given concerning the people of Israel. Cyrus gave a decree that they should go back to the land, build their temple. Darius gave another decree that this should be done. But it was Artaxerxes in 445 B.C. that really specifically decreed that they should go and rebuild Jerusalem. That was to Nehemiah. Now, that then, if we can trace that to that point, uh, we find then there was a decree given, 445 B.C. Now, but the verse, why does it divide two things here? It says, number one, there'll be seven weeks and then 62 weeks. Well, I believe there are two designations here because he's talking about two different things. Number one, he's talking about one rebuilding Jerusalem. But then he talks about the coming of the Messiah. The rebuilding of Jerusalem is seven weeks, years, which is 49 years. And this was pretty precisely true in that day. From the time of Artaxerxes gives forth this command till Nehemiah works and labors and they rebuild the city inside and out, perhaps 49 years isn't uh, wrong. But then you add the 62 weeks for the coming of the Messiah, and that means 69 weeks, or all total, 483 years, and Messiah is supposed to come, the anointed one. Now, we'll come back to that, but let's move on. Now then, Daniel 9 and verse 26. And after the 62 weeks, and that's assuming you've got the 7 done and then the 62 is done, something's going to happen. The Messiah is going to be cut off. Now, that word cut off, it's used in several places. Genesis 9, 11, it means to be killed. God promises after the flood that, that he won't kill mankind with a flood or water. Messiah will be killed. And he'll have nothing, seemingly. And then it goes on to say this, the people of the prince to come, the people, not the prince, but the people of the prince will come. And what will they do? They're going to destroy the city, the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, 
and, and then after that, even unto the end, will be wars and desolations. I think this refers to what happened in 70 AD when the Romans with Titus took Jerusalem and destroyed the temple, the sanctuary, and everything in it. But this is after the 69-week total. And then he says, and after that, there are going to be a lot of turmoil on the earth, wars and back and forth and trouble sometimes. But then we come to Daniel 9, 27. And he, the prince that is to come, shall make a firm covenant with many. And the word many is often used of unbelievers. With many for one week. This is your 70th week. So you have an interlude between the two. And he will cause the sacrifice and the grain offerings to cease. And on the wing of abominations will come one that makes desolate even with full. And then, even with full destruction, one that is decreed is poured out on the one, that's that evil one, the prince, who made these things desolate. So here, this final week, is a prince who is to come, whom we see is the Antichrist. It parallels so much this abomination and desolation. When you parallel this in the time frame of in the middle of the week, if a week is a year, then you have three and a half and three and a half. Well, this is exactly what we find in the book of Revelation. The beast, Revelation 13, 5, the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous word, and it was, and it, this beast, was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months, half of the seven three and a half. And this beast opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name, his dwelling, and is, and those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. Wow. And all who dwell on the earth will worship it, everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. Now, Paul, that's apocalyptic, visionary, but not so with Paul. This is just straight up teaching. Paul says this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day, that day of the Lord, will not come unless the rebellion comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed. We think this is the Antichrist, this beast of the sea. The son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God and proclaims himself to be God. Wow. So I think this is exactly what we find here in verse 27, he's referring to this, this Antichrist. Now then, all of this then has been predicted. But he says, and, and judgment will come upon him, even unto full destruction. And then, of course, we're going to, after that, we're going to circle right back up here to verse 24, and we'll see an end of all of this. It's all completed. God's plan is fulfilled. Now, then, let's think about what we have in front of us here uh, with all of this that we've seen. There is another reason why I believe that these weeks are years. It's because they exactly coincide with the actual coming of Jesus, the Messiah. And so to spiritualize this or make it symbolic, I think you, you miss the real glory of what's being said here. Now, some of this was promoted by a man named Sir Robert Anderson. He was the chief detective for Scotland Yard, and that was just at the turn of the 20th century. 
Now, he died in 1918, but he produced a book called The Coming Prince. He was also considered a theologian of some, and Bible student of some note. And he did, as a detective would, he did extensive research on this whole passage. Now, he knew that the Jewish calendar always used 30 days for a month. We know it varies, but he used, the Jews used 30 days. And so they end up with a year that's 360 years long, and occasionally, to make up somehow, they throw in a, uh, a month. But he researched and calculated the days involved in these 69 weeks, or 483 years. And he broke it down into days. And this is what the picture looks like. He said that down here, 173,880 days. He calculated from the decree of Artaxerxes in 445, was basically in March, and he calculated these days out, and he came up with a figure like April 6th was the month of Nisan for the Jews, April 6th, 32 AD, and he determined that he believed that was the exact day Jesus entered Jerusalem for the Passion Week. That was what we call Palm Sunday to the day. Wow. Okay. His calculations, no doubt, are disputed by some, and they not sure they can totally accept such exactitude as he presents here. But even if he's slightly off with his figures here, and we just take the years and, and end up with a 38 AD instead of a 32, is it not point blank clear that there is no other figure to, to factor in here than Jesus the Messiah? And if he's right, it's to the day that it's pointing to the fulfillment of the Messiah comes. And then after that, he's cut off. And this seems to be then what follows here is a lengthy interlude. So we have, okay, the 49, the decree given to rebuild Jerusalem. And so 49 years later, maybe that's completed inside and out. 62 weeks after that, year weeks, totaling 483, Messiah appears and is cut off. Then we've been in this, as we're in now, this gap of which verse 26 speaks. But there's another one coming, a final week, a 70th week, which in the middle of the week, the Antichrist will break his covenant and set himself up to be worshipped as God. Now we're going to see when we get further in that this does match very carefully with what we're going to read in the book of Revelation. So that this verse 27 brings the 70th week to a conclusion and breaks it in half, which we've seen over and over and over again. We've known in the book of Revelation, there are lots of sevens, 18 of them to be exact, but nowhere does it talk about seven years, and that's a point to note. But what it does say over and over and over again is three and a half, just what Daniel cites here, middle of the week, 42 months, 1,260 days, time, times, and half a time. This all seems to come down to the middle of this last 70th week of Daniel. Now then, to me, this is utterly amazing that God's Word could pinpoint the coming of the Messiah with such exactitude. And you look at it and say, how can the Jewish people be so blind as to not read their own prophetic words and figure that this is Jesus, the Messiah, and he's going to be cut off, your Messiah, your anointed one? Well, indeed, 
there's a blindness. There's a veil put over their eyes until that veil be removed. They're not going to see it, but we should see it. We're meant to know and discern this and to understand it. So isn't it amazing how God's Word so perfectly fits together and coincides, as we'll soon see here, uh, as we move further into this book? Very well then. Let's come now to chapter 12, and let's return and have a look at what we're going to find here. Now, we've mentioned when we talked about this book that it moves between uh, events that happen on the earth, and then we're seeing events that flash up to heaven. We get heaven's viewpoint of it. And then we have flash backwards. Let's see, you know, what happened over here that led us up to this point that where we are here. So we're in one of these in chapter 12. We have it here. 12 and 13 is a flashback. 14 and 15 are a, constitute a flash up. So let's consider what we're going to be seeing here in the and some of the significance of it. So 12 and 13 flash back, we'll get there. 14 and 15 are a flash up. Here's what I think we're going to see here in this chapter. At the end of chapter 11, we were brought to the very brink of God judging mankind. I'm done. It's finished. I'm, I'm done with him. You've killed my witnesses. You've wouldn't give heed to all that I, every overture I made, you refused, rejected, refused to repent, cursed and blasphemed God. I'm done. That's it. And that seemed to be, we're right there. That's expect, okay, God's done. He pulls his people out. Now he's going to just unload on mankind. But no, we stop and we back up. And we're given a flash backwards. Up to this point, we have seen through these witnesses and trumpets what God has been doing. Starting here in verse, in chapter 12, we're going to get a backward, come back again and say, okay, what has man been doing to bring himself to this terrible end? Do you see the beauty of this? See what God has done. We see all these climactic events. And then he stops before he's going to really pour out those bowls of wrath. I want you to see why it's just that I do so. I want you to understand that I'm right when I pour out my wrath on mankind. You just need to see how bad things have become on the face of the earth. And so we sweep backwards and we start up again to see what has man been doing to bring himself to this point. This begins here in chapter 12 with what we call the cast of characters. And it's a fascinating study here, but we're introduced to the last day cast of characters. And so let's have a look now and see. Now, as we look at this chapter 12, there's a lot here that speaks of Jesus, to be sure, the child and ruling with the rod of iron and uh, taken up into heaven. But I want you to notice something if you've read through this chapter. Though it says much about Jesus, do you know what you really see if you take a step back from this chapter and look at the big picture? This chapter is chiefly about Satan. It just is. He's the dominant, uh, predominant figure in this chapter. It's about what Satan has done and will attempt to do. It's about the dragon, predominantly. He is the one who sweeps a third of the angels up in his rebellion. He's the one who attempts to kill the child as soon as he's born. He fights for his place in the heavenlies and loses. 
He accuses the brethren day and night, and he persecutes all believers that are on the earth. So we're going to look at this and see lots about the devil. All right, well, let's hasten on now as time is fleeting. All right, chapter 12, verse 1. A great sign appeared in heaven, and a woman who was clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. And she was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and pain, to give birth. Now, who is this woman who's clothed in the sun, moon, under her feet, that gives birth to a child? Well, let's read on first, and we'll come back to this. Then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his head were seven diadems, or crowns. And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven, and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. But she did give birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. That refers us back to Psalm 2 and verse 9, that the Lord will rule with a rod of iron all the nations. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. <clears throat> now then, we know that the, the child here is Jesus. So who is the woman? Now the idea of the sun and the moon, that ought to remind you of Joseph's dream where he saw the sun and the moon, meaning his dad and his mom, bowing down to him with the stars likewise. So, But it all points us back to uh, Israel. Now, there are some who, who think this woman here is the church, all God's people. Now, as sympathetic as I am to making one people, not two people, one people, Jew and Gentile, there's Christ, neither male nor female, uh, female uh, slave or free, Jew or Gentile, one nation before God. But there are places in the Bible where the Jewish people and the Gentile nations are separated. As strong as Paul is on emphasizing one church, one body, one people, he does in places distinguish the two, such as in Romans 11. But here I think John is doing it. Some say, well, this is the church, but this doesn't work. Does the church give birth to Jesus? No. Jesus gives birth to the church. So this doesn't work. This has to be literally the Jewish people, in my judgment. And so the dragon set to kill the child ought to be remind us of Herod, that, that instigated by the devil through the hands of Herod, he was there ready to kill the child, but God hid him, and he missed his opportunity. But he stayed at it until he finally uh, put Jesus to death. But then we read this that follows. And he was caught up to God and to his throne. That's the ascension of the Lord Jesus. So we have the woman, the dragon. Who, who is this dragon? Well, we're not left in much doubt about that if we skip down to verse 9. And the great dragon was thrown down. He's the serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. So now we have the woman, the people of Israel, the Jewish nation, the dragon, Satan, the child, Jesus, and then we come to these angels figure prominently in this book. And there was, verse 7, and there was war in heaven. Wow. War in heaven. What a strange word. But then we read on, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back but lost. And they were not strong enough 
And there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. Now, Michael and the angels initiate this war against Satan, and he is driven out of heaven. Now, that might seem perplexing to you. This is not talking about before the world began. We're told that we could ask, when did this war take place? And I believed it took place at the ascension of Jesus Christ. There was no longer a place for Satan and his demons in heaven. Well, how could he have ever had one? Well, because he took it from Adam. Much went on when Adam sinned because he advocated control of the earth to the devil. And Paul's going to say in Romans 6, don't you know that to whom you obey, you become the slave of the one you obey? He gave his authority over into the hands of the devil. And rightfully, if you will see in God's word, and Jesus refers to him in, these, in this regard, Jesus, over and over again, actually does call Satan the ruler of this world. John 12, 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. John 14, 30. He's called the ruler of this world is coming. 16, 11, The ruler of this world is judged. How can he call him a ruler? Because he stole it. Adam's place, which gave him legal status in heaven. Ah, but a man overcame him. The man, Christ Jesus, who lived a perfect life, never submitted to him, retook what belonged rightly to man. Now, Jesus is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Jesus is ascended. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the majesty on high of God the Father. Satan has lost all legal rights to this earth and anybody in it unless they give it to him. And so he with a third of the angels are all cast down to the earth. Now what do we read next here? And so then, then I heard a loud voice in him, rightly are they glad, they're happy. Now, verse 10, the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. Jesus has conquered. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He who accuses them before God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony to that blood. And they did not love their life even in the face of death. So Satan, there are many names given to him here. And they all speak of what he does. He's the accuser. He, he will try to turn you in with condemnation. The devil or the adversary, he'll turn you against God and others. And he is the deceiver of the whole world. He'll turn you aside with his lies. But now what happens next? Now having been lost his place to Jesus the Lord and the King of Kings, he's cast down to the earth. In verse 12, for this reason rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Oh, but sad, woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. That's where it's been ever since. He knows this end is coming for him, but he's here to do as much harm as he can. And when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. And again, I believe that's either Jewish believers or the Jewish people. But the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place where she was nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the presence of the serpent. She's protected. Now, if as I, I was right when I suggested that the 144,000 in Revelation 7 are symbolic of all these Jewish believers, then what we see here in 12 
would be a, a rather perfect parallel to the same sealing and protection that was implicated in Revelation 7. Now these are complicated things and there'll be different points of view, but I'm trying to piece, put all these pieces together to get a consistent picture here. So then, what does this ultimate cast of characters look like? The woman, Israel. The child, Jesus. The dragon, Satan. Prominence in these last days, heavenly angels and demonic ones. And then, read on now, verse 15, And the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth. That could be people coming after the Jewish people, after the woman, so that he might cause her to be swept away with the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and drank up the river which the dragon poured out of his mouth. I don't know what that's going to mean, but that she will be kept, preserved, a remnant. God will keep a remnant on this earth for his namesake. So the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went off to make war with the rest of her children. Okay, so who are her children? Well, he's going to tell us who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. That's the saints. Uh, we owe a lot to the Jewish people. In one sense, we are their children because it is through them that the scriptures have been given to us. It is of them that the Messiah has come, that it is through them that this will be fulfilled. So we owe a great indebtedness to them. These then are five of the seven last day cast of characters. But there are two more, two more to come. And next time, we'll look at these last two terrible characters that appear. The beast of the sea and the beast of the earth. And my, what a picture we'll see of what man has been doing. What man is giving, given himself over to in place of God. And why the wrath of God is the only right, just course of action God can take. Well, let's pray together. Oh, Lord, we know these days are coming. We already see men and women worshiping uh, the devil indirectly and not realizing what they're doing. We're thankful for the gospel, though, that it sets men and women free. And we do pray that you will bless it and use it. As, and we pray for more faithfulness from pastors and teachers that they would unflinchingly proclaim that there's only one way back to you, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto you but by him, and that this gospel would be preached. So we thank you for your works towards us and care about us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.